Okay, well, welcome um, to my next video. So this is trying to be uh, bikepacking focused. So I'm gonna talk about accommodation now. Um, and this is based on my experience of bikepacking over the last two, three years, but also backpacking where, we're, which kind of falls into the same, same sort of area. Uh, so talk about accommodation. Now accommodation that you're gonna go for depends on so many things. It depends on how far you're gonna go per day, how much weight you're happy, to, you're happy to carry, and therefore what the terrain is gonna be like, what's the weather like, are there trees, how many people are going, how much comfort do you want, um, how much in the wild do you want to be, how many people do you want to, do you want to meet, do you wanna be quite open, or do you just wanna keep yourself to yourself? So what accommodation you go for depends on many things. And the first thing I do is I think about the three different sorts of uh, bikepacking that I really see myself doing. So three of those, the first one of those is bikepacking, which is a challenge. I'm going from A to B. It's not about so much about the journey. It's more about doing something cool, something that I'm really happy that I've done. And it's sort of a bit of a challenge to me to, to go and do it. I'm going to be wanting to go quite fast. I'm not looking for um, spending much time setting up my accommodation. I don't want to be cooking my own food or having to carry my own food. So I'm living off a credit card, really. So I'm looking at hotels, motels, Airbnb, things like that. And for food wise, I'm just gonna get some, go to the restaurant, I'm going to the petrol station to get some food. You know, I'm trying to go as fast as I can and just do something that's a bit of a challenge to me. And, uh, and there you go. My second one is gonna be bikepacking, which is touring. Now by this, what I mean is um, I'm there for the journey. The journey is the most important thing. I'm probably gonna do 60 to 80 miles for myself. Personally, uh, 60 to 80 miles. I'm probably going to take a tent. I'm probably going to stay in a campsite. I'm going from, you know, populated areas. Uh, I'm not out in the middle of nowhere. Populated areas. I'm going to get my food on the way. I'm going town to town to town. Um, but I'm taking a tent so I can sleep in a campsite. Uh, I don't want to spend too long doing that, but I want to keep my costs down maybe and have the option to wild camp if I want to, you know, camp on a beach, for example. But equally, I could go and stay in a hotel. So that's, the, that's another sort. And uh, finally is exploring. And exploring really is when you are off grid. You're having to carry everything now. Camping options open up a little bit because you don't, you're don't. you not going to be finding campsites. So you, you've got other ideas which I'll talk about in terms of camping. Um, food, you're going to have to carry your own food and you're going to have to importantly cook your own food. You're going to have to be self-sufficient. You're going to need to know how to use the kit. So don't do this off the cuff on the first time. Uh, learn about your kit, learn how to maintain your kit properly and fix it if you need to. Also, you're going to need to take some extra spares if you're doing this sort of riding because you're going to be out in the middle of nowhere. You need to look after your bike and therefore look after yourself. Okay, and of course, if you're doing this exploring, you're probably not going to be going as far. You're going to have a heavier bike. So I'm really looking at 40 to 60 miles in that region, really in a day. So there are three different types. Once I've worked out what sort of bike ride I want to go for, I then start thinking about the accommodation. Okay, the first sort of accommodation is a hotel. Now, if I'm trying to go from A to B really fast, I'm choosing the hotel I'm gonna go for. Um, the great thing about a hotel is you can just turn up and into a town and say, right, where's the nearest hotel? If it's a big enough town, you're gonna to find a hotel of some sort. And unless it's peak season, you're gonna be able to find a room. But I'd always go for hotels on the outside of the town. If you need to go into town, you don't wanna be going in during rush hour, and you're probably gonna be coming out during rush hour. But equally, look if there are any paths, cycle routes that get you in and out of the town really quickly. But if you can, I would go for a town, for a town that has hotels on the outskirts, ideally with uh, food or, or supermarket or something like that nearby. And if there isn't anything, plan ahead, think about the supermarket, um, go through a town, get some food, and then you can get to your hotel uh, and have your food there if you need to. Okay, a hotel is quick and easy to check in. Um, Never any issues uh, I've had checking in, but the one issue I do have is with the bike and storing your bike. They generally won't let you take your bike up to your room, and I've probably bike packed to about six or seven hotels, and they've never let me take my bike in. So you've got to keep your bike downstairs in a lockup or something like that. Think about the security, and what access are you gonna to have to that bike first thing in the morning? Is it gonna be opened up and ready for you? Um, is it secure? Is it in visual range of reception? Is someone gonna be able to look at it all night? And when you put your bike in there, try and lock it to something, I would. But also, make sure you take your valuables off. And importantly, um, set your kit up so you can just take maybe your front roll bag off 
and take it up to your room. The last thing you want is, like I did on my first time I ever did this, was kit everywhere. I have to pull the whole world out. It took me about 30 minutes. I thought, all right, I need, uh, I need my clothes. I want my washing. Where's that? And, and it was all a little bit of a mess. Um, so think about um, how you're going to do this. Make it quick and simple. Put all your hotel room stuff all in one place if you can. And uh, two last things, which are not particularly good things about hotels, are drying stuff. Because you're going to need to wash your own kit. Now, I just get in the shower, rinse everything off, then I wash it all properly, I charge all my stuff, I go out and get some food. But you've got to dry your kit, and generally there's n there aren't any radiators around. You've maybe got a towel drying rack, or you've maybe got a, a hand um, a hair dryer, uh, which are not really good enough. But if you've got two of you, then you really don't have any space to, uh, to do anything. However, if you've got two people, you can save yourself a little bit of money with a hotel. So there's some good and some bad. The last thing about a hotel, which I think is a real negative, is that they're boring. Why stay in a hotel? Go and do something else. Go and stay somewhere else. Now, Airbnb are everywhere, and I've stayed in probably 50 or 60 different Airbnbs in the UK, in Europe, and over in America. So over in America, in California, I stayed on a ranch. It was all hours, there's the ranch. In France, I stayed in a wine barrel. You can stay in some amazing places, and you get to meet some amazing people who own those places, and they maybe meet you there, and they are really keen that you enjoy it, and so they will show you and tell you all about the local area and places to go and have a look at. Airbnb gives you loads of space. You'll have loads of drying uh, facilities. You'll probably have some proper washing facilities as well and drying, loads of plugs to charge everything up. So great in that respect. They'll probably let you take your bike in as well. I've never had a problem getting a bike into an Airbnb, but that was just me. If there are loads of you with bikes, then you need to think about that beforehand and communicate with the, uh, with the house owner to see if they're happy for you to take your bikes in. But you need to do some maintenance on your bike and clean up the drive chain, partic drive train particularly, uh, to make sure that's ready to go for the next day. Okay, and if there are more than two of you, then Airbnb is a better option than hotels because you can probably get more of you into, into one room. One downside or upside of Airbnb is that the distance really is set. So you can't just turn up. You really need to book it and communicate with the owner to try and set up your arrival, etc. I would say the latest you really want to be booking an Airbnb if you're bikepacking is maybe lunchtime. Plan ahead and see how far you think you're going to get. I generally do it the night before I book it. Now the downside of this is that you need to work out realistically how far you're going to get. If it's too far away um, and you're just not going to make it, you know, what are you going to do? Um, however, it does drag you that, those extra 20 or 30 miles to get to that accommodation. But you need to think about the weather, the terrain and all those other things um, when you're choosing how far away you're going to go for your Airbnb. Now, equally, if it's not very far away and you've had the wind behind you and you get to three o'clock in the afternoon and you're here and you're thinking, you know, what, I could get another three or four hours. I'm flying along with the wind behind me. Tomorrow I'm going to have head of wind. I'd rather just carry on cycling. So there is a downside to an Airbnb. And if you're going to do an Airbnb or a hotel, think about the what if. What if you can't get in somewhere? So personally, I would always take an emergency bivvy. I'll come on to those in a second. A bivvy, a lightweight sleeping bag. Um, or an appropriate sleeping bag and then a mat of some sort which you just roll up and have somewhere again it's more weight you don't want to carry more weight that's the whole point of a hotel or airbnb is that you're not carrying extra sleeping gear but you need to think about the what ifs is the weather bad think about the location what the weather might be like and what you might be stuck out in another option are youth hostels and bunk houses now in the uk a youth hostel is a very cheap way to to move around a lot of backpackers youth, use youth hostels bikepackers start using them as well now and they are communal areas you're sleeping in a room with other people um, you know what and they're a great way to meet other people and I've done it a couple of times and I've really enjoyed staying in, in youth hostels that was backpacking um, the good thing is that they are set up to look after backpackers and bikepackers so they are set up to wash and dry your kit and you're meeting other people so isn't this the point of going out and having an adventure is to meet other people so they're a really good option and they're really reasonably cheap as well they're not everywhere but they are around so yeah do your research they're definitely worth um, worth having in your plan now there are other sorts of shelters that you can have out there as well uh, in the UK we have things called bothies which is basically just a really simple shelter and I've had a really pleasant night uh, in a bothy uh, in fact the sleeping wasn't particularly pleasant on the bench but um, but you know the people that were there it was a lovely atmosphere to walk into and equally I've got into a bothy 
in really bad weather um, on the moor on my own in the pitch black and it looks a little bit scary but um, but isn't this part of the adventure so yeah there are other sorts of shelters out there um, and I have stayed in the entrance to a church before once it was in a rural area I felt pretty safe but if it was in an urban area I probably wouldn't do that sort of thing but you could stay in a bird watching hut which I've uh, almost came uh, got my ended up doing uh, once bus shelters under a bridge but it's all risk so you really need to be careful if you're going to do this sort of thing right let's think about uh, camping now so first off I would think about our tents now tents are relatively compact, relatively lightweight. Everyone knows how to set them up. They're quick and simple to set up, hopefully. So make sure whatever tent you buy is quick and simple to set up and make sure it fits in your bike. And by that, what do I mean? Okay, well, this is my tent. Uh, so this is a, an MSR Carbon Reflex 1. It is very lightweight. Well, it's ultra lightweight. It squashes down, I can get the air out of this, down to the size of sort of a melon, um, 750 grams. And that includes the pegs and the poles. And with the poles, importantly, make sure you know where you're gonna put these. So these, I know, fit in my frame bag. Um, if they didn't fit in my frame bag, if they were any longer, they were just really awkward to put in a saddle bag or do I fit them on the, uh, on the bar bag and strap them on, on top of there, which is probably my second option. Um, so think about the size that you're gonna go for. For bike packing, uh, it's not so much weight, I don't think, it's more about where you're gonna put these things. Now with tents, you can go for um, the ultralight. Now that's what I went for. I went for a one-man ultralight tent. That was maybe a bad decision. Now, one of those is probably okay in the summer where you can get your kit outside, you can sort your kit out and, and, uh, and get yourself squared away. But if the weather is bad, you know what, they are not good because the one I've got is quite compact. It's not, it doesn't give me much room up here. I would much rather a two man tent that was cheaper and probably weighed twice that weight, but it had gave me loads of space because if the weather's really bad or there are loads of insects out there, mozzies, and you just need to have a bit of a, uh, a safe space to be, um, then a two man tent is what you need for. If there's just one of you, two man tent, Two of you, a three-man tent is what you really need to go for in the winter or if you don't know what the weather is going to be like. The sort of tent to go for, look on um, on uh, on other sites. But really, you want something with a vestibule, which is like a little porch where you can cook your food. Uh, if there are two of you, go for vestibules on either side. So you can both cook your food and you both get in and out without disturbing each other. If you can get something that is freestanding, i.e. you don't have to peg it in, so it gives you more options for camping. Um, and the snag with bikepacking is that unlike backpacking where you are out walking in the countryside and there are loads of places to probably sleep um, and it's a, probably a very quiet area back bikepacking you're on the bike um, wherever you look you can't really camp there because you're not being stealthy someone else from the road is going to be able to see you so in order to find a wild camping spot you need to get off the road to go and find somewhere so there's a little bit of a problem with, with tents in that respect. And I would also always therefore go for a dark colored tent, something that's gonna be inconspicuous. You don't want people giving you a hassle what you're doing here. Um, so you wanna be as inconspicuous as you can. However, in a campsite, they are great because they give you some security, i.e. out of sight, out of mind. You may be able to put your bike into the tent while you go off and get some food. Um, they give you some privacy as well. Um, so there are lots of benefits are on a campsite with a tent. Another great thing about a tent is that it gives you some ventilation. So they are not bad in the wind, if unless it's too exposed. They are very good in the rain um, and they're very good for condensation. So they've got good ventilation generally, uh, which allows you to keep, keep condensation down because you don't want your kit and everything else getting wet. So a pretty good option for the bad weather. Okay, and tents are good also for bug protection. Um, and weight-wise, for a tent, really ultralight one-man tent, you're probably looking like mine at about 750 grams, up to about 1.5 uh, kilograms. Two-man tent, you're probably looking for relatively cheaply, you're probably looking at about 1.5 to 2 kilograms, and then three-man looking above that. But you can bring that considerably down. Um, but like I say, pack size and pole size are quite important if you're gonna bike pack. Weight is relatively important, depends what sort of terrain you're gonna work on. Um, but a good thing about a tent is, if you've maybe got a three-man tent for two of you, you can share the kit between the two bikes. So there are definitely some ways you can get around the weight and space issues. Right, so well, when I said about that they give you privacy, the other downside of the privacy bit is that you're not 
as out with nature. So some people actually want to be out and feel like they're sleeping outdoors, uh, sleeping under the stars, which you don't really get from a tent. Um, depends which way you want to play this, but uh, I quite like sometimes just to feel like I'm out uh, sleeping outdoors rather than in my little cocoon. Okay, another option uh, is a bivvy. Now, a bivvy is effectively a bag that you're going to climb into. Um, some people think see them as an emergency shelter, and that's what they used to be for mountaineers. Uh, they're effectively an emergency shelter. Um, if I was going to stay in hotels, motels, long distance, then I'll probably take a bivvy, uh, an emergency bivvy, as a backup with a sleeping bag, like I say. Um, but they're a very optional um, way to sleep um, outdoors. You are out with the wild. Um, when you're in a bivvy, they are great wind protection, fantastic from the wind. Um, they are very good in terms of the rain, um, but they're not good when it comes to condensation. So if it is warm and it's summer, uh, when you breathe, you breathe out about three quarters of a litre of moisture at night, and that moisture has got to go somewhere. Um, and so what you can find is you get a lot of condensation in these things. So you need to think about ventilation with them. So ideally you're not going to cover your face up you're going to have to breathe out of there so you um, so you want some sort of ventilation but equally you don't want bugs to get in so you may need some bug meshing so there are lots of different sorts out there but they definitely have got their downsides what they do do though is increase the temperature of your sleep system by a good five maybe ten degrees centigrade so it may be very cold out there and you may your sleeping bag may not be great but you know what if you've got a good bivvy uh, around you that's wrapped around helping keep that heat in then they can be really good and i'll show you some of the bivvy options i've got now okay so this bivvy is called a sole escape bivvy it's definitely an emergency bivvy it squashes down to about that sort of size um, it's a great option. It is open, there is a pull cord here uh, and there is a zip on the side which is about half length zip. This comes up and it goes around and you can pull it down around your face. It is a lightweight and it is it will add warmth to your sleeping system. So not a lot of extra weight if you're going to go in a hotel but you know what I wouldn't use this as my main accommodation if I'm going out bike packing. I do have another option for one. Um, and this one is a little bit more uh, stealthy, which is probably what you want really. Um, this one is better waterproof, better windproof, but there's certainly no breathability in this thing. Again, it's a pull cord which just pulls around your face and in there you've got your sleeping bag, you've got a blow up mat um, and that's about it. Now what you can do with bivvy bags is um, set them all up beforehand so you can have the bivvy bag in there goes your sleeping bag, under that goes your inflatable mat which is deflated, you roll the hole up, it goes into your bar bag. So they can be out, set up really easily. Um, but the thing with a bivvy bag, what turns a lot of people off is that they can be quite claustrophobic, having that material right over your face. Personally, I've kind of got used to it um, and I tend to keep my face out so I'm not breathing uh, into the bag and causing a condensation problem, which is a big problem if you've got a down sleeping bag because that is going to absorb all that moisture and cause you problems. And you can get down, which is protected, which is um, sort of uh, treated so that there's a little bit of a protection against that. Um, but in a bivvy bag, it can, get, it can get quite wet, particularly if it's moist and warm. So they are a winter option, I would suggest. Now to get around the claustrophobic uh, idea, you can get ones with a hoop, and their hoop is just around the head area. And so I've got two of these. Um, one of them is a Terra Nova Jupiter, which I don't think they do anymore. A fantastic bag. Um, it weighs 650 grams only, so it's certainly heavier than the other ones with the hoop um, but it's got a um, bug meshing in there it's it's a top loader so you crawl in from the top and get yourself in but you know i'm quite happy in there reading a book watching a film uh, it's a very pleasant experience um, and the other one i've got which i'll show you now very briefly i won't get it out uh, but but certainly look up bivvies and hooped bivvies there are loads of different types this is one and a half kilograms this is a dutch military bivvy this is for winter, this is friggin awesome, uh, really warm, but I would not be taking this bike packing. It's just too heavy, really. You know, I could take a tent for the same weight and bulk as this, I can take myself a tent. So not really something for bike packing when you get to this sort of weight. So bivvies, look for things, maybe with a hoop, uh, is probably the best option, gives you the most flexibility. Uh, you're looking at about 750 grams for one of those. Good thing about a bivvy is that they are stealthy. So unlike a tent where, where it's harder to find somewhere that's suitable where you need the space and the ground and the no rocks, etc. 
with a bivy, you can fit in much more, much better spaces. They're low profile, they're stealthy. You can keep out of the way, you can just pop over a hedge and disappear and people on the road won't even know that you're there. So they are a really good option um, if you don't want to hang around and be looking for places to stay. Um, but if you're going to stay on a campsite, they don't give you the privacy that you would get from a tent. You can still go and get changed on a campsite in the in the local facilities, uh, but you don't have space to get your kit out and organise it. So if it's pouring down with rain, you get to your location, you know what? Your sleeping bag is going to get wet. You're going to have to open up the bivy. Everything's going to start getting wet. Um, you don't have space to, to sort things out. So in that case, I would say they're a summer option. But the trouble with summer is that you get more condensation issues. Um, so there's a bit of a thing, a bit of an issue with a bivy bag. It's not that simple. Okay, so what you can do to get around this rain problem uh, and yeah, throw around the rain problem is to take a tarp. Now a tarp is basically a big sheet. You can get them really quite small. Um, so you get a tarp, um, they take a little bit of skill to set up. You have a ridge line, you have guidelines. They're kind of like a tent, but they're a lot of lighter weight, but they can be set up in lots of different ways. So there is a bit of a skill set to doing this. And you can have them so they've got a backing to protect you from the wind behind you. And then into porch mode, you can have them as an A-frame, which is the more traditional. You can set them up in some sort of crazy ways. You've got a three by three meter tarp. You can set them up so they're almost like a tent, which I've done once. It didn't look particularly pretty, but, uh, but you can set them up that way where you get loads of wind and rain protection. So that plus a bivy can be a really great way. So you can sleep out under the stars, but you know what? If the weather's gonna be bad, you can just set the tarp up to give you that rain protection. And that'll give you a big area where you can sort your stuff out while it's raining and you don't have to worry about getting the damp inside your bivy. So tarps, lots of different sizes. So this is a tarp that I've got there. That's quite a big one, uh, an even bigger one. And then I've got an even bigger one in there. And then I've got an even smaller one as well. Um, so yeah, so how do you set them up? You generally set them up in trees. So you take your bivy and you set that up near a tree and then you'd use the tree to help put your tarp out to give you all that protection. And they're great because they get you out in the wild. Um, if you don't have any trees though, you can use poles, you can use your bike, you can turn your bike upside down on the wheel, that can be help with one of the ridge lines and then the other end you can maybe put a stick to hold it up and then use your guidelines to peg the thing out. And so there are loads of different options out there. Again, look those up, but a tarp with a bivy is a system really. Uh, that is worth considering. Right, and my favorite, without any shadow of a doubt, is a hammock. Now, I find hammocks so comfortable. Um, I'm a side sleeper. If you're, if you sleep on your back, brilliant. If you sleep on your side, they're okay. If you sleep on your front, they're probably not worth it because you then have to go for um, a bridged hammock, which is quite a lot heavier. Uh, so for bike, back, bike packing and backpacking, they're a really good, comfortable option. Um, now, I'm a side sleeper. However, when I've had a couple of beers I and I'm sleeping on my back, um, I can snore sometimes. And that has attracted some attention from a stag uh, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, and in fact, a uh, wild boar, which ended up being right underneath me, uh, which I scaled off with my torch. Um, so yeah, there's my little story from, uh, from a couple of weeks ago. But anyway, uh, hammocks, let's talk about them. Right, hammocks are an art. You've got to learn about them. Because you have the hammock, you've got the underquilt, the top cover maybe, you've got your bug net, you've got your straps, uh, your suspension system, um, you maybe got a, a gear sling, you got there are loads of different um, things that you need to learn. They're actually very simple, but there are lots of different ways of doing it. So you need to learn the way one way of doing it, uh, and that's it. But once you've set up, they're pretty simple. But you need a tarp to go with these as well, and you need some warm. And that's what a, where a hammock falls down really is the warmth side of things. Okay, so these are good in the summer. So if the temperature is 20 degrees centigrade or above, hammocks are great. You don't need to take too much gear, but still they're gonna weigh around about 1.5 kilograms. You may be able to get lighter than that, down to maybe one kilogram, but that's the sort of weights you're looking at. If you're gonna go below plus 20 degrees centigrade, down to about plus five degrees centigrade, then you're going to need to take more kit and you're probably now looking at about two kilograms in weight of kit maybe 1.5 if you're lucky but you probably are looking at about two kilograms in weight um, if you want to go below plus five degrees centigrade 
you really do need to start take, upping uh, the amount of gear that you're going to take to keep you warm. And the issue with the hammock is the warmth is taken away. Any sort of wind under there takes warmth away from your back and you will lose a lot of heat. Uh, the sleeping bag just isn't going to uh, help you out with. You're going to need to take um, a tarp with you because there's going to be rain. Um, however, you are out in the wild. It is a lovely way to spend an evening looking up the stars. If there's not too much uh, in terms of uh, coverage from the trees, to look up at the stars. And they are a cool way to, uh, to, to experience the outdoors. Um, you can set up a hammock um, on the edge of a cliff, uh, uh, over a waterfall, on a beach. Um, there are loads of different options for hammocks. Um, and the great thing about them is that they are very stealthy just by the nature of being in the trees. So you can be cycling along uh, on a road and if you can see some woods you can get in there and you know what you don't need to worry about the ground. All you've got to do is find two trees that are, that are about 15 feet apart, get your hammock up and you've got a great really comfortable place to, uh, to spend the night that is very stealthy and the people aren't going to uh, pick out easily. Now where you set up a hammock uh, where you can use a hammock really does depend on the country that you're in. So if you're in the northern hemisphere, somewhere like Sweden, Finland, Germany, the UK, France, trees are relatively abundant, uh, they're relatively big, and you can have no problems. If you go down to Spain, you'll find the trees are smaller because of the heat, uh, and therefore it's a lot harder to get hammock going. And the further south you go in the northern hemisphere, the harder it's going to be. Um, in order to do this. So they have some limitations about where you can use them, but in the UK, there are woods everywhere. Loads of options uh, to wild camp at with a hammock. However, what you can't do, much like a bivy really, you can't hammock at a campsite. You could do, but it's a lot harder. Um, you can be inventive uh, with your hammock. On the corner of wooden fences, you can string a hammock and, uh, and sleep there. So there are options, it's just that you've got to be quite inventive and you've got to be lucky that you find the right sort of place. So they're a wild camping option, really. They don't offer you much privacy. You have a tarp. Uh, my winter tarp that I've got, for example, is almost like a tent over the hammock. So that is very private, but most tarps mean that it's not particularly private. Okay, and hammocks obviously don't suffer from bugs on the ground. And the one thing I really don't like are slugs. Now, in a bivy once, I remember waking up in the morning and a slug had gone up over. I looked like adamant. It had gone up over my nose and then back out the other side. It was gross. I just don't like it. Um, so I'm, I'm very much into my bug protection. And you can get bug protection on hammocks that will go, that's already built in, or you can have it that you just pull it over like a sock over the over the thing, but it gets you off the ground. Um, you're still going to get hassle from flying bugs and mo mozzies, etc. But again, these these net this netting helps you get around that problem. Okay, and finally, hammocks are cool. Let's face it, they're so much better than being a ground dweller. Um, so I love hammocks. Um, when would I use one though? They are a summer option, um, definitely for summer. I do do. Uh, I said do do uh, winter hammocking um, or I will do because I've only really just got into hammocking um, but not bike packing I will do it backpacking to walk in somewhere because I can carry the gear but on the bike it's just too much weight uh, to be a viable option really okay and the final option is camping and accommodation is cowboy just take your sleeping bag and sleep out under the stars now the snag with that is that you're probably going to want to do that in the summer when they're all the bugs and everything else are around. But if you're a hard man, if you're a cowboy, then you don't really care about that sort of thing. So have a go, it's not for me. Um, but yeah, it's definitely an option, but maybe not in the winter. So overall then, accommodation it depends on so many things. Depends on the terrain, how fast you want to go, what the weather's going to be like. Do you like your comforts? Do you like your privacy? Do you want to be out in the wild? Do you want to meet people? How many of you are there going? Um, loads of different things to think about. Um, what would I use? If I was doing the challenge, then I would stay in Airbnb um, by a mile. That would always be my preference, but I would always take some sort of emergency backup with an emergency bivy and a small sleeping bag, etc., just as a backup option. Um, if I was going touring, then you know what? I have to say I would take a tent, although it kills me to say I would take a tent. It gives you, over a long period of time, it gives you the flexibility to stay at a campsite, it gives you protection from the weather, uh, it's well ventilated, they're easy to set up, they're easy to get repaired. Um, they are the better option, I hate to say it. 
if I was going exploring, then I would try something different. I would take a hammock, I would take a bivy. They will always be my two number ones, a bivy with a tarp. They'll always be my two number ones that I'll go for. The hammock I would do in the summer and the bivy with a tarp I would do in the winter. And they are always gonna be my go-to options. But I would only really do them for two or three nights maximum where I knew what the weather was going to be like and I knew the sort of conditions that I was going to be in. If I was doing it over multi-days, exploring, off-grid, then I'd still have to take a tent and I'd almost certainly take a two-man tent there to give me that flexibility, protection. And you know, if the weather's really bad, I can hunker down and just deal with it uh, in my tent. So there you go. They're all different options for, for accommodation. If you're bike packing with a little bit of a slant for bike packing, um, again, it's just based on my limited experience um, of bike packing and backpacking um, and what I've learned from YouTube. So by all means, go out. I don't want to repeat what other people say. Um, go out and look at all these different options. Um, if you like the video and you found it useful, then please hit like. Uh, if you not subscribe, then please subscribe. Um, I'm going to do lots more content uh, on bikepacking as much as I can find the time uh, to do um, and consider sharing it with someone else who may be thinking about doing this sort of thing. Um, and finally, uh, thank you to those that have subscribed. I'm just over 100 subscribers now, not that I'm chasing numbers, uh, but it's nice to know that other people are watching and then what I'm doing is of some use to someone. But uh, there you go and thank you for watching.